Good morning, everyone. Russ Barkley back again with your weekly research review. And I'm also back in flannel again. Now, that's surprising, old men in flannel makes perfect sense, especially when it's just about 43 degrees outside and winds are about 10 to 20 miles an hour for a heck of a wind chill. But uh, don't feel sorry for me. We live in a lovely area here. Let's begin, as always, with our few dad jokes. These come from goodhousekeeping.com and their website. And the first one is, why was Cinderella so bad at soccer? She kept running away from the ball. <laughs> yeah, you got to love that one, don't you? What did the horse say after it tripped? Help, I'm fallen and I can't giddy up. <laughs> All right, last one for you. What do you call an angry carrot? A steamed veggie. Yeah, you should have guessed that one already. All right, that's bad enough. Let's get on to our research. Uh, first up is an article that comes to us out of Sweden. Uh, and this is a study of how common pain is reported by 10 to 11 year old children who have higher or lower symptoms of ADHD. Now, let's be clear. These children are not diagnosed. They simply have, some of them have elevated symptoms of ADHD and the rest of them do not. But we're talking about a pretty large sample here of nearly 1,200 children that have been followed over time and given various questionnaires. And in this case, these 10 to 11 year old Swedish children were asked to point out on a mannequin where they might have been experiencing pain how often that pain occurred, and the extent to which it was uh, severe, that is the degree of the pain. And then the authors began to combine these pain scores into determining whether children could be classified as having frequent pain, uh, which usually was weekly or even daily. And if they had multi-site pain, which is at least three or more sites, that were reported at least weekly or more often. And then they looked at the extent to which these reports of pain were related to degree of both hyperactivity impulsivity and degree of inattention. But let me go back and remind you now, these are not clinic referred children. This is a general population sample. What did they find? They found that about 52 and a half percent of the children who scored relatively high in ADHD symptoms, reported at least weekly pain or more often. And that was compared to about 36% of the children who had fewer ADHD symptoms. So 52% versus 36%. Obviously that difference was significant and therefore they can say that kids with elevated symptoms of ADHD report more pain on a weekly basis than kids with less symptoms of ADHD. Interestingly, multi-site pain was much more common among girls, particularly with hyperactivity, as compared to boys with hyperactivity. Nearly double, in fact, about 51% of the girls who could be classified as high in their hyperactive symptoms reported multi-site pain versus about 28% of the boys who were high in hyperactive symptoms. They also found that weekly headache and or abdominal pain was reported by a quarter or more of the girls with elevated ADHD symptoms compared to only about a fifth of the boys. Um, so what did they find? Uh, they found that girls had more of those abdominal and headache symptoms. Now remember, these are 10 to 11 year old children that we're talking about. Not older children, not girls who might already have started their menses in which we might expect to see more abdominal pain with them. Uh, so in any case, the authors conclude that pain is reported more frequently in children with elevated symptoms of ADHD. And depending on the kind of pain, it might be reported even more in girls than boys. Pain was more commonly associated with elevated hyperactive and impulsive symptoms than it was with inattention symptoms. Okay, so very interesting study there that kind of goes along with some of the other research that's out there suggesting that children with ADHD, whether they are clinically diagnosed or just have elevated symptoms, have more medical complaints of a general nature. In this case, including 
pain. Now, it goes without saying that we're talking about children's self-reports here. So the extent to which these are accurate and reliable is not really established in this particular study. We do know that children with ADHD sometimes exaggerate their reports of events. At other times, they may even uh, underestimate the extent of their symptoms and impairment. So kids can kind of be all over the map in their self-reports, and we need to keep that in mind here. But that would have been true across all of the children that were in this study. So the fact that there were differences found between kids with high and low ADHD symptoms suggests that there's something here about ADHD that is linked to more frequent pain, particularly uh, headaches and stomach aches and multi-site pain. Okay, enough of that study. Let's move on and take a look at another study. This one was done here in the U.S., and it was a study that involved 395 universities and it included a sample of more than 224,000 undergraduates from those various universities. And what the authors are looking at is the frequency with which individuals reported having ADHD, being on medication for ADHD, and using prescription stimulants without a prescription. In other words, what we would call prescription misuse in the population. Now, why this is interesting is that periodically here in the U.S., we often hear how extensive stimulant drug misuse is among college students, even those without ADHD. Uh, and so you would think that, oh my God, we're going to find some really big numbers in this study. And what this study shows is that it's not all that common. Let's have a look at some of the results here. They found that among the students that were included in the study, nearly 10% reported a lifetime diagnosis of ADHD. Now, we got to be careful with that. First of all, it's lifetime, not current. And the second thing we have to be cautious about is it's self-reported. This was not validated through an assessment of the individual or through getting their clinical reports to be sure that there was in fact a clinical diagnosis. So uh, it's possible then that this figure is a somewhat overestimate. Uh, but still, about 9.6% reported at some time in their life having had a diagnosis. Now, they found that about 5% of individuals reported having taken medication during the past year, and this is appropriate use of medication. So about half of the individuals who had some kind of diagnosis of ADHD across the lifespan were currently taking medication for it. Finally, and here's the kicker, just 2.4% of students reported having misused prescription stimulant medication during the past three months. Hardly an epidemic as is sometimes represented here in the U.S. Doesn't mean it's not going on out there. It certainly is. But it's nowhere near the levels that our media has represented it as being at times. And that's because the media tends to rely more on anecdotes rather than on real data from surveys of universities uh, and therefore tends to, I think, exaggerate uh, the extent of the problem. So uh, there you have it, folks. How often are stimulant drugs used and misused in the college population? About 5% are taking it appropriately for their diagnosis. About 2.4% are misusing stimulant medication. By the way, individuals with a diagnosis of ADHD who weren't taking medication were 40% more likely to be misusing it. So among those misusing medication, as you can see, there's a higher risk that they had ADHD anyway and that they were using someone else's prescription in order to manage their symptoms or for other reasons they may have been taking medication. So a nice study out of the U.S. there involving lots of universities and many thousands of students. The next paper that comes up is out of, I think this is out of Denmark. Let me just double check. Yes, indeed. And this is a study on the co-occurrence 
of eating disorders with ADHD and autism spectrum disorder. And it's looking at the extent of the genetic risks here between these disorders, that is between eating disorders and between these neurodevelopmental disorders. This is also very large population-based study, uh, and uh, they have calculated the genetic risk scores for eating disorders and for ADHD and autism spectrum. By the way, what does that mean, a polygenic risk score? Well, they use entire genome-wide scans, <clears throat> for which we now have very large databases of people who have had their genomes scanned. They then go through and calculate the number of risk genes that the individual may have. They then take that number and they also weight it by the extent to which that particular gene contributes to risk for ADHD. So it's not just a sum of these genes, it's a weighted summation of the different risk genes for these different conditions. In this case, eating disorders, ADHD, and autism spectrum. And what did they find? Well, first of all, they found that if you had had a diagnosis of ADHD or ASD, you had a significantly elevated risk of having an eating disorder. Interestingly enough, it was primarily anorexia nervosa within the autism spectrum group, which was not found so much in the ADHD group. Now, they went further and found that your polygenic risk score for autism, for ASD, was positively associated with your risk of having anorexia nervosa. So there's a genetic contribution going on here between these two disorders, between autism spectrum and between anorexia nervosa. They found the opposite relationship when it came to ADHD. They found that the polygenic risk score for anorexia nervosa was negatively predictive of risk for ADHD. Now, this has been found in other studies, not just this one, where ADHD, if it is found to have a relationship to anorexia, the relationship is often negative, meaning that people with ADHD are at less risk of having anorexia than are people in the general population. On the other hand, as you know from my other videos on this channel, that ADHD is positively associated with an increased risk for impulsive eating, binge eating, and bulimia. So uh, the quite different pattern of the relationship between ADHD and eating disorders and autism and eating disorders, ADHD being more likely linked to impulsive and binge eating and bulimia. Autism, on the other hand, having more of a link to anorexia. Okay, very interesting study that looks at genetic relationships there that came to us, as I said, out of uh, Denmark. And then finally up is a study reported over in translational psychiatry. This is on the extent, the genetic contributions to ADHD and the extent to which they are linked to metabolic and cardiovascular disorders. This is a very large study involving more than 50,000 individuals who were genotyped. And again, the authors calculated the polygenic risk score for these individuals and for their siblings. So this is a sibling study, not just a study of individuals. By the way, by studying siblings, we can begin to tease apart the extent to which there is a direct genetic relationship between the genetic risk scores and to what extent the risk for these disorders, these metabolic and cardiovascular disorders, might be due to the shared family environment. So what did they find? They found that elevated ADHD genetic risk scores were definitely significantly associated with cardio and metabolic diseases. They were also associated with biomarkers for cardiometabolic problems, such as lipid profiles, blood pressure problems, uh, 
type 2 diabetes, uh, and uh, other conditions. So the genetic risk for ADHD, the higher the genetic risk, the greater the likelihood of cardiovascular problems and of cardiometabolic problems. Now, interestingly, when they went back and controlled for the shared family environment, about half of the relationships disappeared. It was reduced, leaving only the relationship between ADHD and metabolic disease still significant. What does that mean? It means that to some extent, the shared family environment is also elevating the risk for cardiovascular diseases and for obesity and type 2 diabetes, uh, but especially for cardiovascular disease. Now, that doesn't mean that it's the social environment, because let's back up here. Where are we getting our genes from? From our parents. If our parents are also likely to be carriers of these genes, those people with elevated ADHD risk in the parents, the parents may be creating an environment in the family that predisposes offspring to cardiovascular disease, to obesity, and other problems. So uh, there's still an indirect genetic effect that could be going on here besides the direct genetic effects I've just described in the study. So keep in mind, sometimes there is a genetic contribution to the environment as a result of our parents having similar risk genes for ADHD in this case. So a fascinating study there, uh, as I said, that was uh, reported over in translational psychiatry. So a uh, lot of genetics here this morning, but very important for us to understand the extent to which ADHD genes are also setting up risk for other conditions. So thanks for joining me this morning. I hope that you enjoyed these uh, research reports. By the way, there were more than 30 such research articles published this past week. And I had to go through them and sort through uh, what was in a journal, what was peer reviewed, uh, and specifically what I thought might be the most important uh, findings for you to understand. So thanks for joining me on the channel. I'll see you again next Saturday for more research. And in the meantime, thanks for being a subscriber as well. And as always, take care, live well, and please be well. Bye now.